course, it's a pleasure to be here today. Okay. <laughs> and first of all, you know, thank you to Joel for accepting my pitch and for setting up the whole seminar. Um, as mentioned already, this is part of my first chapter and hopefully soon a first um, publication. And uh, since I'm still kind of in early stages, I would really appreciate your criticisms and feedbacks. So I'm really looking forward for them. Now, this is, of course, the, the, the title, the quite long title of my presentation. And um, I would just, I think I'll be around 40 minutes. Perhaps I'll be cutting a little bit of time off the last section, which unfortunately due to a travel um, restriction has kind of been impossible to access those kind of archival informations. So uh, this is more or less the, 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 the structure of the paper. And um, I think I can like just start with the whole thing. Now, my argument is pretty straightforward. So between the, the 1890s and the 1920s, Japan was integrated within the geographical imaginaries and the global networks of travel established by the Swadeshi movement. And I intend to demonstrate this by looking at the life and times of, of Puran Singh, one of the most towering features um, of the Punjabi literature. Now, I decided to use a Puran Singh as a prism through which better understanding the Japanese entanglement for, for four main reasons. First of all, he enables, he enables me to focus upon the pre-Russo Japanese war period of interactions. In fact, if the historical consensus about the pivotal moment of, of 1905 is to be taken as true, my goal here is to show the basis upon which the 1905 moment happened. And Puran Singh's life and education in Japan between 1900 and 1904 is then a chance to bring back the chronological frame. Secondly, Puran Singh has left a vast number of written records, either in forms of poems, novels, autobiography, uh, scientific paper, translations, or in the form of biographies written by his relatives and friends. As we know, these kind of written records are very rare, and I, and I just didn't want to miss a chance. Uh, number three, um, I hope I think that in more than one way, Puran Singh uh, epitomizes the kind of Swadeshi inspired trajectory of going to Japan and return that was actually more common than we might have assumed until now. And lastly, I want to focus on Puran Singh because I would like to move away from a history of Indo Japanese relations based upon singular and often unsuccessful encounters and move towards a broader social history that considers the cultural and political condition of South Asia as well. Now, having said that, I uh, let me define two key issues here. First of all, is the relationship between science and empire, and specifically science and the trans imperial, since I cover here two empires and the movements that happened across them. As Kapila, as Kapil Raj has pointed out, a good portion of the historiography of science and empire has focused on the modalities of diffusions, often assuming a Western center and a peripheral rest. These kind of assumptions have often obscured the fact that modernity and its institutions were not prefabricated items bestowed and absorbed mindlessly by others. Rather, there is always a proper, a proper a process of what he terms of collisions, compromises, and coming together. So in my research, I want to look at these issues of transmissions and circulation from uh, the kind of uh, the scientific knowledge um, from more like a, lit a lateral perspective, that is from a perspective on, of inter-Asian entanglements, following re recent scholars such as Richard Jaffe and Nicole Aboitits, I want to cast again the attention to the Asian and regional dimension of the stories of these people, thus not assuming the West as the sole interlocutor. Doing so, my goal is to understand how inter-Asian interactions shaped claims about alternative modernities of a specific Asian character. First disclaimer though, uh, I'm not interested in asserting whether or not these were actually uh, uh, actual alternative modernities, since it is in, it's in almost an impossible task, um, especially when we take into account Chatterjee's argument about the derivative discourse. What I'm interested in here instead is to understand how these claims uh, cl um, came to be how they circulated and how inter-imperial competition, cooperation and comparison influenced them, always bearing in mind that interactions between South Asia and Japan 
happen within a system of highly unequal power structure. The second key issue of this paper is the Swadeshi movement. For those who might not be aware, the Swadeshi movement sought to build the, the practices to ensure the autonomy of the major national space of Bharat, of India. Uh, its main politics being the boycott of the British goods, the fostering of indigenous capital and establishment of indigenous enterprises. All of this to create the model productive, self-sacrificing laboring subject as a normative citizen. In essence, as Manu Goswami argued, uh, Swadeshi was a modern developmentalist project, end of quote, based upon the nation as a natural unit of capital accumulation. Now, uh, canonical studies on the Swadeshi movement, such as Sumit Sarkar's landmark study on the Swadeshi movement in Bengal, have defined the Swadeshi around a particular space, time, and political strategy. Sarkar, for instance, focused on the responses of of the Bengali middle classes to Curzon partition of Bengal in the early 20th century. The historiography upon which I draw today has instead put more focus on the external aspects of Swadeshi, on the outward dimension of Swadeshi, and the multiplicities of times and spaces that in open for citations. For instance, here, a key concept, as you may see in the slide, is Chris Manjabra's concept of Swadeshi knowledge internationalism, which has proven extremely influential for me. Manjabra focuses upon the power of this outward dimension of Swadeshi to push Indians outside the British India axis um, and to search for alternative sites of knowledge production, especially that kind of knowledge necessary for the formation of the national space, that is science and, and the technology knowledge. Now, um, on the historiographical problem of Japan as a model, we could be discussing this for hours, I think, and the positions are very varied. Although, for brevity's sake, I would say that it's enough to mention that uh, the idea of Japan as a model for South Asia varied greatly depending on the specific period that we want to analyze. Broadly speaking, however, we can trace the emergence of two, of two distinct <clears throat> arguments uh, about the, the, the Japan model, which of course seem to kind of be at odds at each other. While, again, this is kind of early stages, I find myself more inclined to agree with more Gilbert since he shows how Indian used the Japanese model to challenge Western hegemony, rather than uh, following it in, uh, simply saying that uh, the Japanese were, were just interpreting Western modernity. Uh, yes, Western modernity, sorry. So after this long preamble, uh, let me return to more practical issues and let's start with my discussion from Punjab. And here on the left, you can see a picture of the festival day in um, Pindi or, or Rawa Pindi, which was the village where Puran, one of the villages in which Puran Singh uh, grew up. Now, uh, the two main arguments that I put forward here are essentially the first is that the interest about Japan emerged in South Asia towards the end of the 1880s. Initially as part of the, of the broader critique of British policies of modernization and later as a model for the subcontinent based upon a perceived sense of cultural affinity. Secondly, since science and technology education, as well as access to it, became central arguments for the nationalist critique of the British Empire, a grassroots system of scholarship was established to send students to Japan. Now, uh, so here is the main person of the of the of today. So I guess I should just ask, who was Puran Singh? Puran Singh was born in 1881 in northwestern province of the British Empire, a region that was one of the latest to join the empire. And here you can see more or less where are we talking about. So if this is the Punjabi sort of northwestern part, we're talking about this area right here, just below Kashmir. Now, um, so Puran Singh was, was already, uh, already had a particular kind of uh, educational upbringing since he, was since he was born in a Sikh family and was later educated in a mosque before moving to more westernized educational facilities in Lahore and in the Rawal Pindi. Uh, he was one of the brightest students of his community since a very early uh, young age and he was soon noticed by local educators and pushed toward further studies. 
Now, the first point that I want to clarify here is that Peran Singh's love for Japan, as I will show later, did not come out of nowhere, nor it was unusual for the time. Now, uh, of course, as I mentioned already, due, due to the travel restriction I've used uh, for this section, mostly um, primary documents coming from um, an online-based uh, archive, the, the, the South Asian open archives. And uh, my analysis is based upon uh, mainly one set of sources, that of the Kirtikian report of, of, of native papers, which is kind of a primary source that is, I think, very well known to historians of empire. Uh, so these reports were requested by the colonial administration to monitor public opinion, especially in vernacular press. By studying these reports, then I not only have a chance to see what was discussed in local languages, but also what kind of topics were monitored by the colonial state. Amelia Bonea has already discussed a similar issue, although her study focused on, the, on how the values and the interests of both the colonial state and the Bombay mercantile class shaped the way in which Japan was reported in two key Anglo-Indian newspapers in Bombay. Borrowing her methodology, I then proceed to understand what was considered newsworthy by these vernacular newspapers and who was the target audience. I think that these reports helped me to understand a key issue. That is the fact that discourses about Japan did not circulate only in the English speaking strata of society. The fact that news about Japan uh, were disseminated and discussed in local languages might point towards the fact that these were much more, that these um, news about Japan were actually much more uh, spread, like widespread than we might have assumed until now. So to understand such discourses, such discourses eventually is to understand the cultural environment in which Puran Singh was brought up and why he was sent specifically to Japan. Uh, so, South Asian interest in Japan emerged at the crossroad of two key historical moments. First was, this, uh, was the first set of, of Meiji reforms, which put special emphasis on the promotion of industry, uh, shokusakogyo, uh, which led to what Richard Sanos has described as a techno-nationalism, which linked nation building with, with the development of science and technology, or what he called gijutsu rikoku. In many ways, as Law Morris as well has pointed out, the Meiji restoration did, did not just open up Japan to trade and foreign influence, rather it enabled Japan to participate in a global system of knowledge. The second revolution happening at the same time was that of long distance communication. And since the early 1870s, with the opening of two direct lines of communication between Japan and India. Now, it was thanks to the second revolution in communication that, for instance, the Hindustan newspaper of, of, uh, of the Kalakankar, a small daily newspaper in Hindi from a city not too far from, from Puran Singh, uh, would congratulate on February 24th, 1889, the Japanese people for the establishment of a parliament. And the Meiji constitution, as we all know, had just been issued on the, on the 11th of the same month. By the early 1890s then, Japan became uh, the center of many arguments disproving the British belief that Indians and non-white people in general were not able to self-govern. Just a few years later, in, in 1893, an Urdu weekly newspaper also named the Hindustani, but based in, in the lock now, uh, put more bluntly what many were, stay, were starting to think. And I quote, the history of modern Japan is well worth the study of every Indian. End of quote. The argument thus became, if Japan can, India can do it as well. With the victory of Japan over China, the tone began to change. If until now almost no mention had been done about Asia, Japanese victory over, over Imperial China was seen in Darwinian terms by some commentators who praised the developmentalism of Japan and criticized those in India still unwilling to change. Already by, by 1896, Arguments portraying Japan and India as being part of the same regional and cultural imaginary began to emerge. In perhaps the strongest attack against the British that I found so far in, in this vernacular press, the Moda Vritta, a weekly small publication written in Marathi, following up on the previous 
on a previous rumor about the Maharaja of Koalpur granting some visas for students to go to Japan, argued that first, the court in the Kolpur had finally realized, and I quote, the folly and delusion of, of the ridiculous stereotype system of sending Indian pupils in Japan, in, in, in England, uh, that land of false and ungrateful British, end of quote. The article mentions how since the British goal is to impoverish India rather than share their knowledge, Indians must do their best to not allow them to profit from the colony. If money needed to be spent outside of India, might as well not be England. Now, uh, the second point that the article put forward was that, I quote, the Japanese are an Asiatic and a non-Christian people, and our contact with such an industrial nation is bound to result in some good to this country, end of quote. With these few examples, well, what this, this, these few examples have shown, however, is merely a broader change within India at the time, since the first generation of politically moderate leaders were being challenged by a more critical generation that, as Bivan Chandra demonstrated, reflected upon the broken expectations of the British model of modernization. This new generation of nationalist leaders saw education as an especially powerful tool, and between 1880s and 1920s, as Sanjay said and Mizutani have pointed out, both access and quality of Western education became issues for many Indians. Seth especially uh, pointed out how many nationalist leaders who I would add uh, later ended up interacting with Japan uh, criticized the British educational system not only for not fulfilling its promises of modernization, but also for having as a side effect in the few cases in, in which education was accessible uh, as a side effect to de-Indianize Indians. That is, British education was accused of de-rooting Indians from their own traditions and country. So Japan and its educational system came again to the forefront of national debate since it was argued that Japan had somehow managed to maintain a strong national identity despite the progress it had achieved. That the Japanese system of, of scientific and technological education was established in the late 1870s, first with the first schools of engineering and the first universities. By 1884, uh, the already formed Tokyo Mathematical Society expanded into the Tokyo Mathematical Physical Good Society, and by 1897, the imperial university system was established. And by 1907, the three major universities that of Tokyo, Kyoto, and Tohoku were up and running. What is perhaps more interesting to notice here is that Morris argues that in Japan in 1870s and 80s, scientific and technological education had a double societal function. On one hand, it was necessary for the, advance, for the advancement of national industrialization. On the other, it was also supported by the government to divert the energies and the minds of the Japanese youths towards more socially constructive subjects rather than the more divisive so social sciences and, and humanities. Ironically, although, uh, citations did not share the, the same beliefs, and instead they soon understood, and here lies, I think, the contribution of the Swadeshi ideology, uh, the anti-colonial nature of such modern knowledge. Thus, the Puran Singh, inspired by the idea of Swadeshi, could later claim that, and I quote, we had the honor of being the first students from Punjab to Japan, and for once, not for a barristership, but for ushering a new era of, of industries in the country, end of quote. So Japan soon became an ideal destination for Indians, not only for its perceived Asianness, uh, which also have, uh, which would have allegedly smoothened the assimilation of Indians in, in a Buddhist country. There were also pragmatic reasons, uh, such as distance, cost, and the prospect of escaping the control of the colonial state. To do so, however, students had to actually reach Japan, and in the vernacular press soon emerged calls to create scholarships to go to Japan. Between 1890s and the late 1910s, four main systems of funding emerged, and none had the support of the colonial administration, which did not mean that the, the colonial government was not involved. Actually, both the Japanese and the British imperial apparatuses soon began to create institutional blocks to curb the influx of citation students in Japan. In fact, not only both empires saw Indian's activities as uh, subversive, subversive and against the rule of law, but as Mitsutani pointed out, the Japanese had not much to gain from an economic point of view from the industrialization of India. 
Now, the first system of scholarship of, of funding that emerged can be seen here in the slide. And of course, it's an initial division which uh, would, uh, would intend to simplify the issue. And as we can see, Puran Singh arrived in, in Japan thanks to uh, the individual of effort of a certain Bhagat Gokal Chand, who was somehow related to him. Gokal Chand uh, was, um, he was a local educator and was able to convince the wealthy citizens of Pindi, as he called, as uh, Rawal Pindi was known, to gather some money to send some of the brightest students in the community to Japan. According to Puran's autobiography, Gokal had been the first in Pindi as he, um, to have an interest in technical education of pupils. And along with, with Puran Singh, another student from the area who went to Japan, a certain uh, Damodar Singh, whose family had to take a special loan to pay for transportation and, and enrollment fees. Such cases of grassroots funding were not limited to Pindi. In articles from the, from the vernacular press, it is in fact possible to read that other people, especially him, for instance, had been organizing in the same way. Uh, always from the vernacular press, we can trace other kinds of, of funding systems, such as the one with local rulers, uh, who were another major force in sending Indians to Japan. Between 1890s and 1920s, several rulers granted money for scholarships. Uh, here I have mentioned just the main ones. And of course, in the case of Hyderabad, the, wor the works of Nile Green have already shed some light upon reasons that led some, some of these rulers towards Japan. In fact, it is always important to bear in mind uh, Green's argument that not all interactions were nationalist in nature. Most of the times, these rulers sought knowledge to modernize their polities rather than pursue a unified India. However, in the last two decades, we can find a more distinct, in the last two cases instead, the political association and the educational and professional association, we can find a more distinct um, nationalist um, ideology behind it. If you look at the political associations that funded students towards Japan, we cannot deny that the ultimate goal was purely nationalist and clearly inspired by the Swadeshi. The National Social Conference, for instance, an, offering, an offspring of the reformist branch of the Indian National Congress led by Justice Ranad, who met with Puran Singh on the way to Japan. At the 1900 summit in Lahore declared that and I quote, the member of the community will utilize this young man's services by establishing their own mills and factories for the purpose of encouraging India, Indian manufacturers and affording their countrymen a wider field of useful employment. Thus, in the same conference, he was agreed to send, uh, with support of other local institutions for, for the advancement of the conditions of lower castes, another two students to Japan with a fully paid scholarship of 3,000 rupees. Uh, last, there were educational and professional associations. They provided scholarship to hundreds of students going abroad, but not necessarily only to Japan. And perhaps the most famous one being uh, Jugesh Chandra Ghosh, uh, Association for the Advancement of Scientific and Industrial Education of Indians, quite a long name, uh, that in less than a decade of, of activity sent more than 100 students to Japan which overall was about one fourth, one fourth of the total scholarship granted. Now, having explained all, all of this, let's return once again to Puran Singh on the way to Japan. In 1900, he left India traveling toward Tokyo via Singapore and Hong Kong. On the way to uh, his school, Puran had the chance to experiment firsthand the power of British imperialism abroad, as well as the shared condition of domination across Asia. I think that his trip to Japan was for him very formative and prepared uh, for the events to come. Now, in the second part, I want to discuss the educational choices of students from the subcontinent uh, going to Japan. And then I will show how the very experience of studying abroad in Japan was a crucial moment of radicalization for many Indian students. For this section, I have used primary sources gathered from colonial documents of surveillance, published books, and other statistics. But the bulk of my data comes from, <coughs> about South Asians in Japan, come from a collection of certificates of identity granted by the colonial administration to almost 100 Indians between 1909 and 1917 for trade, study, work, or travel. Uh, 
The collection turned out to be extremely data rich since every application contains many crucial information such as family status, the, the place of residence in Japan and letters of recommendation from Indian educational institutions. However, these documents only represent a part of those who were granted. Declined applications were usually followed by a detailed police report, but unfortunately so far I haven't been able to find it. And what really uh, made me curious about this collection was the fact that I, I didn't know that existed uh, business cards at the time, both in, in English and, and, and the Japanese, which is something for me ex extremely interesting, but I guess maybe someone else might have already known about this. Now, uh, Puran Singh arrived in Japan knowing almost nothing about the outside world. And in the few years there, uh, his life would completely change. He arrived in Japan as a good Sikh, a prodigious student using sea routes between India and Japan, firstly established thanks to the business acumen of the Tata family and the Nippon Yusen Kaisha, a, a famous shipping company. He left Japan as a seditious Buddhist monk with a degree in industrial chemistry, ready to contribute to the political industrial development of the nation. And this is him as a Buddhist monk in a, in a photo of the time. Okay, uh, of the nation. Okay, so uh, the decision to travel to Japan was taken hundreds, if not thousands of times by South, by South Asians all over the subcontinent between the end of the 19th century and the first decades of the 20th century. The overwhelming majority of them traveled for days with all intent to acquire scientific industrial knowledge. Although there, there was also the odd cases of the students of arts, philosophy, or literature. Those who could travel from, of course, those who could travel came from wealthy backgrounds, high caste Hindus, Muslim or Parsi merchants, landowners, tax collectors, and other, or uh, the sons of other local administrators. The Tokyo Higher Technical College was without a doubt the school where Indians applied the most, but sometimes the records do not clearly show a preference. But if we uh, connect the subject chosen by the students with the other schools that every now and then are mentioned in the documents, it is possible to argue that Indians were widely distributed around Japan and not just focused on Tokyo. From the north, uh, from Hokkaido and, and the Tohoku, where they would be studying agricultural and marine products, to rubber manufacture in Osaka and ceramics in Kyoto. And of course, with Tokyo, which attracted most students thanks to the, the wide offer of, of uh, schools. So for instance, in Tokyo, they, they could be studying sericulture in Nishigahara, or glassmaking, or paper making, or lithography, and so on and so forth. So this quick overview should help us to understand that Japan was chosen by Indian for a wide variety, for a wide variety of scientific and, tech, and technological subjects. We should then abandon the kind of view that, that portrays Indians in Japan as a small communities limited to the Kanto region or later to Kobe, and instead moved to complicate the story by adding the other areas of Japan and other educational institutions. Now, and, and this is a wonderful picture of Puran Singh at the time. He, you can see him here uh, standing up on first on the left. Now, uh, re returning to Puran Singh, as soon as he landed, he was welcomed by some, by some of the members of the then emerging Indian community of Yokohama, which before the infamous 1923 earthquake had put deep roots in the commercial and political strata of the area. What I would like to highlight here is that by the very beginning, the Indian community in Japan, and I think okay, the Indian community in Japan, and which I actually mean uh, Indian communities, since um, I would argue that in Japan emerged two to three distinct uh, communities of South Asian, a merchant one based in, in uh, Yokohama and Kobe, um, an, and also an academic one. Although the academic one could easily be separated again into two other communities, that of the students and that of the academic community, since with time also Indian professors would come to Japan to teach South Asian languages or philosophy. So these communities actually lived in, in a kind of symbiotic relationship with each other, in the sense that merchants often supported students economically or with lodgings, 
while students created important connection for future business and revolutionary activities. The first two students, and I, I think there's a good chance that these students could be in this picture, although I can't so far um, recognize all of the people in this picture, uh, were two young Indians called Kulkarni and, and um, Ramkanta Roy. And these are actually two, the two, as far as I've seen so far, the, 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 the two earliest names uh, mentioned or accused in, for seditionist activities by the colonial administration um, of students in Japan. So they actually went on to have a kind of like successful, almost, although brief, revolutionary careers and participating in the anti-partition protest in Bengal and while also touring Japan to give lectures about the violence of British rule and mobilizing students from both India and other parts of Asia living in Japan. And, and Puran goes as far to say that it was thanks to their to Royce and, and, and Kulkarni's collaboration with some Japanese uh, at the time that Indian students re received um, such warm welcomes and support while studying there. Now, um, on the topic of the radicalization of, of Indians in Japan, I think there has been quite a lot being written already. And Stolten, Fischer, Tine have previously demonstrated how Tokyo by the first decade of the 20th century had already become one of the main centers of Indian colonial activism, also, to, also thanks to the establishment of a branch of, of, uh, of the Hindus, while Maris Johnson, Rebecca I Carl, and many more have been successfully showing now for quite some time how Japan had become perhaps unwillingly at first, the home of, of many Asian exiles searching for political and economic support for their own agendas. So Asians went to Japan to be educated, but also to escape the control of their empire. Often they met with powerful figures such as uh, Shibusawa Eichi, Takakuzo Junjiro, and uh, as you can see here, Okuma Shigenobu and others. But the early interaction, but this kind of early interactions were by no means an endorsement by the Japanese uh, government overall uh, of the, of the uh, activities of Indian Asians. Rather, the Japanese establishment for, uh, was for a long time quite, quite suspicious of these seditionists, not only because their activity put in danger the alliance with the Western country, but also because they perhaps feared that the collaborations with, uh, of all of these Asian exiles might complicate actually the administration of, of their empire as well. And I would say that only by the late 1920s, a more coherent Pan-Asianist agenda was embraced by some levels of the Japanese elite. But by that time, the rise of Gandhian politics and the economic penetration of the subcontinent by Japanese products and capital had almost completely changed the condition of the Indo-Japanese endowment that I'm discussing right now. I would also like to mention that Puranzin radicalization was not only political, and his conversion to, B to Buddhism after meeting Swami Ram Tirtha in Tokyo shows us that he also entered Japan at a moment of religious ferment, sustaining, further sustaining what Sami Siddiqui has recently argue, argued about Japan becoming, and I quote, a significant site for inter-Asian conversations about world religions, end of quote. And I think it, I also should mention Nagrin work about uh, Islam and Japan. In fact, according to Puran Singh's hagiography of the same uh, Swami, Tirtha had become in Japan in the first place because he had heard that Okakura Tenshin was organizing a new parliament of religions in Tokyo. And lastly, uh, it is important to specify that not all South Asians in Japan were anti-British, nor everyone supported Japanese imperialism. As recent research by Peters and Mitsutani has shown, uh, there were also many Indians who criticized Japan on the basis of solidarity with the anti-colonial plight of Koreans, as well as others who were simply loyal to the British, often working as imperial spies for the local, in, in the local communities. So, so now I enter the, the, the final part. When Puran Singh returned home, of course, he was a very changed man. 
all the experiences and emotions that he uh, had during this brief encounter with Japan would linger on for the rest of his life. And as expected of him, he began disseminating the, the, the scientific knowledge by teaching and so started to set up and work in factories and laboratories. In 1907, he was appointed for the most important job of, of his life, acting imperial forest chemist in the prestigious Deradun Forest Research Institute, which you, you can admire here in this wonderful photo of the time. And during his time at the research institute, Puran wrote many scientific articles, often about the chemical qualities of trees coming from the stage. Having probably had the chance to study firsthand these trees in Japan, it seems that Puran used these academic papers about trees from Japan and China to introduce new, new techniques and processes that might have been still unknown to the scientific community of Deradan. Now, uh, curiously, in 1908, he introduced one of these articles with an interesting title, announcing himself as first as a member of the Pharmaceutical and Chemical Societies of Japan, and only after as an acting imperial forest chemist. And his colleagues were not, and doing my research about the, this kind of, of uh, phrasing, uh, no one of his colleagues was, were using a similar phrasing in both the Indian Forest Memoirs or the Indian Forest Records, which were the two main academic journals where he published his, his research. Now, although, again, this is kind of early stages, I would argue that Puran Singh, by pointing out his affiliation to the learned societies of Japan, was claiming a, a sort of scientific authority that, had, that went beyond the West, and that qualified him as someone who was part of an Asian kind of modernity. Now, uh, to conclude with him, uh, his, revolutionary, uh, his revolutionary activities continued in Deradun, and many revolutionaries such as Haradayal and his old friend Kukarni and others visited him and his house in Deradun, which he had named Ivano. Uh, he also acted as an intermediary and sometimes financial supporter for Indian students who wanted to go to Japan. And in his autobiography, there is also a small story about a certain man called Hari, who had sought Puran's help to escape to Japan because he was being chased by the police. And Puran Singh adds that although he didn't know the man very well, this, this man's face was soon all over the news. And later he married with a Japanese woman almost overnight. So I think for those who might be aware of the topic, I think there is some ground here to believe that the man in question named Hari could be Rush Bahari Bose, also because Bose, was at the time actually working in the Forest Research Institute as well. But this, of course, would require more uh, archival research, which at the moment I can't do. Now, um, I think this last point, I would like more time to cover this last point, but I think I'm gonna just um, let you read this slide. And um, I just want to, ask, to point out that what these two examples point out is simply the fact, again, that Puran's story is not unique. And many students from South Asia had very similar experiences and they almost always follow the same tra trajectory from India to Japan and back again. And the cases here of, of uh, Kesi Dasgupta and Surendra Mohan Bose are just two of those examples. Uh, finally, Again, my main argument has been that between 1890 and 1920, Japan was integrated within the geographical imaginaries of the global networks of, and the global networks of travel established by the, by the Swadeshi movement. And I think I demonstrated this by looking at Puran Singh's uh, life into three different moments, highlighting in every single, in every moment, a different aspect of the world, of the world in which Puran Singh was, was living. So I think the last thing that I would like to add is that, of course, this research, apart from the need to uh, expand on the uh, archives in India and Japan, and not only in India, actually, also in, some in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Pakistan, I would say that seeing from, seeing from the sources that I've found so far, there is also a question of Japanese industrial experts traveling to South Asia. And for those of you who might be aware, uh, there is a famous travelogue by a Bengali woman traveling to Japan to meet the, uh, the, the in-laws. 
In fact, uh, she was married with a Japanese um, chemical expert who had traveled to, to, to Bengal. So what I'm trying to say here is that uh, if there is a section of the story uh, which shows Indians going to, to Japan for technical education, it was also the case that many Japanese went to India as experts to uh, set up, to help set up, set up the factories. One, one of the major cases, for instance, being uh, Tata's seal factory in, in Bangalore. Um, and lastly, I think there is also a need to access more, uh, to do, again, another kind of the same analysis of uh, newspapers and, and, and the print media to understand what was the opinions of the Japanese um, people about South Asians at the time. So I'm sorry for having spoken for so long. I hope it wasn't too boring. And I look forward from hearing your questions and feedbacks. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, Francesco. So the uh, floor is open. Uh, whichever method you find com comfortable, uh, please direct your comments or questions uh, to Francesco. Hi, um, Roger Macy here. I'm not, yeah. I can't, um, uh, I don't know whether you can see me. I'm not, I, I but anyway. Um, yeah, uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I'm speaking from London and I uh, don't have an academic yeah. background, but anyway, I, I, you know, I'm very interested in this. Um, and I mean, there are several points, if, you know, actually, if I, if I may. Um, I mean, I was, I was, um, you mentioned somewhere in there the expression de Indianization, and um, which kind of raised the question of having a context concept of being Indian in the first place. And um, um, the, there's an obvious comparison with the uh, Chosu Five. You presumably know that the in the previous generation, these these young Japanese men who were sent to London uh, to study various different disciplines, and certainly in the sort of simplified narrative um, that is presented, they went as loyal to their daimyo clan. You know, they went to. Um, support the, the Choju in their fights against the, the, the Japanese government, you know, to, to strengthen regional, regional bonds. And later, of course, became the leaders of the Meiji uh, state in, um, and very much you know, in, in, in a Japanese concept, which uh, was not the motivation of which they went. And so, you know, there's an interesting parallel there. And, you know, because as you pointed out, a lot of these were funded by individual um, princely states. I'm sorry, I might be using the wrong expressions here, but, um, you know, to what extent, um, you know, was, you know, is this a reflection of um, um, a growing concept of an Indian nationality or, or, or is it, with that, where am I? The wrong way. Perhaps I'll, I'll, I, I could have other questions, but let's let's just start with that. Should we gather more questions, or should we just like respond to each one? It might be easier for you to respond as they come, you know. So. Okay. So yeah. Okay. Thank you for your question. Um, was there a kind of concept of Indian, of um, of Indianness at this point in time? Well, uh, I think it's it's hard to say, but I think the Swadeshi movement goal was that was that to create a sort of national um, identity or like a certain kind of national spirit. I think that the concept of Indianness most likely varied from person to person or like from region to region as well, in the sense that these, of course, like we're talking about extremely diverse areas and. I think at this point in time, and, and I'm talking about the late 80s and late uh, 90s, 1880s and 1890s, uh, 
I think mostly we are talking about the first emergence of like a, a concept of India in terms of like an economic space, or at least this is what the Swadesh and, and, and Manu Goswami's understanding of the Swadeshi movement is, is coming from. And I think her argument about the fact that it was the this kind of like the creation of an of a, of an economic national space that that le then led to the formation of nationalist uh, argument is actually very interesting in this point. But again, I think if you want to search for like specific visions in terms of culture and stuff, maybe the idea is that it varies regionally and locally. But I think they all share the kind of understanding of India as a as an economic space, as a space that was in formation and had to be uh, formed and extrapolated out of the British Empire. If that helps answering your question. Thank you. Yes, it does. Yes, yes. I mean, um, if others want to come in, um, I don't want to hog it. But anyway, I'm, um, I mean, the next thing I would say was the absence of China in, 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 your, in your narrative um, that you, you early in, in your talk you were painting a picture of how um Japanese were were, were look you know looking to the Meiji restoration um even before Japan became a any kind of a dominant power but um they, they admired the process um and and but you, I think you only mentioned China as the country that Japan beat you know in in, in, in the war I mean but um was there any kind of um regard for China as a center of civilization, you know, in, in this period, or was it out of, out of mind? I think that um, the way that China is discussed in that kind of, in the, especially during the, the Sino-Japanese War, the, 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 the first Sino-Japanese War. Before that, I'm really... China, Before that. <laughs> in actually, the generation is, before is, that. I don't think he's, as far as I've seen, it, it, it is not really mentioned. I have to say, though, that for practical reasons, I have kind of keep, like, I kept myself, like, avoiding China in a bit, because this kind, because my research so far is getting already very big, so I know that at a certain point, the China has to come in. So maybe for the future, but, but I think, in this moment, you know, for a PhD, you, you have to keep it practical. So I, I've, I try to avoid getting bogged in into that, that kind of um, material. But I can tell you that, although before I'm not sure, by the early 1880s, when Japan is firstly mentioned, Japan, is still, Japan and China are still perceived as like, as a couple. Every time they mention Japan, they mention China as well. And there is a clear sense in the early 80s that Japan and China are another thing, are another sort, another kind of civilization. But then, as I tried it to show, after the, the defeat of China, there is kind of like the whole sense of China's uh, the prestige kind of falls. And the idea that India and Japan are actually part of the same cultural sphere or the same kind of geographical imagination starts to make sense. And I think there is a connection here between the fall of the Sinosphere and the emergence of kind of like a new Asia, of course, always in a new kind of like an understanding of, of Asia as something where India and Japan could actually be on like related to each other. Because yes, there's always been Buddhism, but Buddhism in Japan, as you may know, it's always been uh, like filtered through East Asia. And the few examples that we have about, uh, I think uh, Fabio Gravezzani, I think his surname, wrote about this, about the, the idea of India in like the pre meiji era. And we see that the connections with Japan are so, between India and Japan, are so like textual, are not actually like physical, like we would see uh, after the, uh, the opening of Japan. So yes, again, when China as an idea falls, then there is this kind of creation of a new uh, idea of Asia. Thank you. Yeah. Well, my last point, if I, if, I, if I may, is completely unconnected and was when you mentioned the soap factory and my eyebrows raised because surely the raw materials of traditional soap making are the waste products of, of animal slaughter. 
um, mm. and, uh, and this is a, a you know a, um, a fervent Buddhist um, you know promoting soap manufacture. I mean, to what extent was he practically involved in this um, um, venture? I mean, or was he just uh, you know the chemical engineer? Soap manufacturing uh, or sugar manufacturing? I thought Which you one? said soap. Uh, I thought. Oh, I need. I think soap was. Um, I need to double check. Sorry, maybe I, <laughs> I might have miswrote. Uh, maybe I misheard. Ah, yeah, the soap factory. Yeah. Yes. Um, actually, really interesting question. I'm uh, <laughs> I'm not aware of it, and I think I need to look into it. But but yeah, I just know that he he was involved. But um, I think. Soap manufacturing, as far as I know, also like in Bengal, there the was like, um, for instance, the, the, the Japanese that married the, uh, that, that Bengali woman, he was working in a, a soap factory as well. He helped set up a soap factory in Bengal. And I'm actually not aware of this kind of like religious uh, issues with the making of soap. And I think it's a very interesting thing to be looking at. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll come in if you don't mind. I, I'm, I'm speaking to you from, from Mumbai, so apologies for the, the glare, as you can see from the pre monsoonal uh, sun out here. Very interesting presentation. Um, and I, I just wanted to ask you at the beginning uh, how does this fit into your dissertation? Is your dissertation looking uh, at the whole breadth of, of Japanese students traveling to, to in, uh, sorry, Indian students traveling to Japan? Uh, prior to World War II, or, or is, is there is some more context you're giving in your dissertation? So this, so this one is the first chapter, and in the first chapter, I was, I think, I I, I wanted to dedicate it to scientific interactions. So there was um, a kind of like, uh, again, that's why I mentioned in the end that the kind of like Japanese experts going to, to Japan. This yeah. was a, a chapter that was supposed to be about scientific interaction. And there is like actually more stuff that I want to, that I haven't mentioned, like uh, the collaborations between Indians and Japanese in the Tohoku Mathematical Journal as well. So that, that it's, also, it's also like a big part of this chapter. Uh, how it fits in the overall dissertation. In, in my dissertation so far, and of course, you know, uh, it's early on, it's the second year, so please be... Oh, that's, that's, that's be good careful. progress, it's only your second yeah, year. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm still figuring everything out. Um, in the dissertation, I, I'm, I, I'm trying to look to like several kind of interactions, but always trying to bear in mind the kind of like this double circuit of uh, Indians to Japan and Japanese to India. So like another chapter would be on uh, the... Would, would open with the establishment of Indic, Indic studies departments in Japan. But then it would lead back to, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but there were three Japanese um, professor that, that teaching in the University of Calcutta between oh, in, the early, in, in the early 1910s. Okay. So again, this kind of second chapter would be something on the way of, while Indian students were going to Japan to learn the modern uh, technology and, and science, some Indian students, some Japanese students would travel to India instead to learn the, from the, 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 the Pandits and from the other uh, kind of like religious figures in, in India, the source of their kind of cultural civilization. That's so right. again, it is kind of like, it's a broader kind of way to understand Indo-Japanese entanglement, again, away from the single encounter and trying to understand the broader, the kind of yeah. uh, social aspects of, of the whole thing. What, one, one thing that you know, I've encountered in, in my recent research, you know, and, you know, since you, you have access to Japanese, which I don't, you, you might be able to find more stuff on is, um, the other thing that really interested Indians about Japan in this era was commercial education. Uh, kind of pre pre business management education, and you know, I mean, uh, Indians, as you may know, I mean, you know, look to kind of places like I think what the Tokyo School of of, of higher 
uh, higher commercial studies of, uh, I'm sorry, I'm probably getting that name incorrect, but places like that. And I, I know at least in Modern Review, which was a, a big publication, English language publication published out of Calcutta, there was um, one Indian student, I think, studying in Kyoto at the Imperial College uh, talking, you know, he essentially wrote a, uh, you know, an article exhorting, exhorting Indians to come to Japan to study, you know, commerce in order to build up kind of business and business techniques. So that might be another interesting area to, to explore. Yes, actually, I think if I, if my memory if it doesn't betray me, <laughs> which often does, but uh, let me see if I can find that picture again. So in, in this picture, you have like this party of people from Mazor. So if I traced this party correctly, this was sent by, Mizor, by the Maharaja of Mysore for, um, for like helping this group of people. I think there were more, almost like 10 people overall. Uh, to actually learn about commerce and learn about mm. the uh, the way, in, like not only the conditions in the place, because to understand how, like the business conditions in in, uh, in Japan, but uh, and also like the kind of like the commerce like strategies and stuff, like as you mentioned, as you mentioned the, uh, the commercial studies. Although it's something that I've actually haven't gone through yet, because I think it's. I, I think I have a chapter on like the, 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 the merchant community, yeah. but it's so far away that I haven't actually, I haven't actually like thought about it yet, but this could actually be something like, thank you so much. I hope to not like uh, get into your, <laughs> your area, but, but I hope to like look into all. it again. Yeah. Yeah. So, if, if, you do, if you do, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, and just to finish about this, the story of this picture, um these actually soon the, the british like uh, once they knew that this party uh met with with okuma i think this is around 1916 or 1915 they cut everything like they just started like putting down all the sort like all kinds of like to put up all, all sorts of bureaucratic blockades to like prevent again these people to go there because it was getting a bit out of end, and of course, we we always need to remember in this case is the is the Indo-German conspiracy case that during the, the First World War made this kind of interactions more intensive. But at the same time, everyone was looking like trying to block them, both the colonial states in like in in Delhi and Tokyo, like both of them. Yeah. So if if you do come to India, if, if you need any advice for archives, feel free to reach out. I mean. If, if Indian really archives, like yeah, Indian archives are a bit difficult to work with, as you probably know. <laughs> but but there prob yeah, probably is some pretty interesting stuff over here. And I, I know at least from you know the research that I've done in private papers, you know, I, I wrote a, a, a book on uh, Dadabai Naroji, a, a, a Indian nationalist. I recall one of the, the letters that he received actually around the time of the Swadeshi movement was from a group of Indian students in Japan. Uh, kind of exhorting mm. him to take a more radical position. And I think they end even with that slogan, Vande Mataram and stuff. So there, mm. there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff, I think, that's 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 worth exploring in this field. So sounds cool. I look forward to your work. I'll contact you as soon as possible. I'll try to look you for <laughs> Google. Otherwise, please like send me your email somehow, please. <laughs> yeah, sure. sure Thank I can, you. I can send it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Interview. Hi, yeah. can you hear me? Hi, hi. I met you yeah, at yeah. Justice Conference last year. Thank you very much for yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. Sorry? Yeah, I remember, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for your really exciting paper. And I have actually four questions. And first question is about the uh, kind of um, presence of Punjabi network in the network of Indians in, I mean, Japan, in Meiji and Taishan world. And uh, recently I had to give a talk in Yokohama and I had to talk about yokohama Bombay relationship actually in the colonial period. And at that time I noticed that actually in Yokohama, Sindhi merchants and Parsi merchants are quite prominent, especially Sindhi merchants. But it seems mm -hmm. that these Punjabi uh, and other, I mean, uh, students from other areas in India also, I mean, probably had good relationship with these uh, Merchants and they could also get funding, but I'm just wondering whether uh, this, I mean, Punjabi identity, I mean, worked or did not work, or whether they kind of, I mean, integrated, uh, tried to integrate with, uh, I mean, these merchants, I mean, uh, without thinking too much about 
uh, this Punjabi network, or whether there was actually a Punjabi network alongside. So that is my first question. And the second question is, I, I mean, I, I, I really agree with you uh, that, that we can certainly utilize a native uh, paper uh, report. And I also got uh, so much information from there. Uh, but I was also wondering whether you can also look at uh, resources, uh, kind of original sources, like textbooks, school textbooks, for example. And I looked at majority textbooks book in the late 19th century and early 20th century. And in textbooks, uh, like reading series for uh, standard first to standard uh, six, for example, they already had essays on Japan and China uh, talking about Japanese modernity and so on, comparing that situation with other regions in a Asia. So I'm just wondering whether you can find similar sources in Urdu, like, I mean, I, I don't know whether, uh, I mean, you, you can actually get access to Urdu textbook in Punjab in the same way, but it seems at least in Western uh, part of India, like Bombay presidency, there was this, I mean, awareness of, I mean, uh, Japan as kind of quote unquote model. So you have, for example, Karge, uh, Harvey, who established that women's university based on Japanese women's university and so on and so forth. So I'm just wondering whether you can find similar situation in Punjab to some extent. Sorry, I'm talking too much. Third question is, uh, sorry, uh, the third question is, one of my colleagues has been working on small, small industry, small factories run by Indian merchant in Japan. And I mean, for example, matchboxes, I mean, these Indian merchant in Japan in the early 20th century produce much boxes to export to India. So there are Swadeshi much boxes, uh, so that, I mean, uh, they want to sell in India, but the, these factories were actually in Japan. And it seems that if you look at small uh, industry, uh, in, I mean, there are stories about a collaboration between Indians and uh, Japanese merchants in big industry, but I think maybe small industries can be really interesting, like match boxes and glasswares and so on, which were produced in Japan, but which were exported to India. So I'm just wondering whether that part also can be uh, included in your, uh, I mean, not maybe in your thesis uh, right now, but in future, uh, in your future project. I'm uh, sorry, the last one. I started, look, I, just like you, I, since I couldn't go to India and UK for uh, two years, I started looking at uh, sources here, and I looked at uh, travel logs of Japanese intellectuals uh, who visited colonial India in the 1920s and 30s, and those included architects and professors, and for example, professor of economics also, and it seemed that uh, there are different kinds of interactions among intellectuals uh, in the 19th, 19th century and early 20th century, and we tend to look at Buddhist connections so much, but it seems that even about economics, there was some uh, interaction, interaction as well. So, I mean, we tend to talk about Okakura uh, uh, Tango relationship, but there are different kinds of, yeah, I mean, networks and interaction. And interactions. I'm, just, I'm really excited about your work and I hope we can do some joint project in future. Thank you. Uh, sure. Okay, so uh, for the first question about the Punjabi networks and Punjabi identity, uh, Full disclosure, I don't speak Punjab or like Urdu yet, so, but it's on the it's uh, it's on the program. Like uh, as soon as I finish with the Japanese, I'll start with uh, one of the major, well, one of the or of the of the South Asian languages. So that's why I've been kind of relying so much on like e uh, English written sources or anyway, like helping with the, with like translations and stuff. And I'm going to be honest, until now, I, I haven't been able to find anything specific to Punjabi identity. Like in terms of like so far, anyone who I've been looking at so far hasn't mentioned anything specific, but I've keep like an eye out. Like, of course, if I if I look at anything, I'll, I'll start like, like putting down like notes and stuff about it, but I haven't actually find anything about it. And in terms of like the Bombay Yokohama, like Cindy merchant um, that you mentioned, yeah, I think those were the first ones to arrive. And of course, like Cindy merchant, I think South Asian merchant, merchants in general had quite the advantage in Japan as Markowitz, I think he, he wrote about this about the Indian uh, networks of, of like merchants in East Asia. And he mentions how like these people essentially found themselves in a position of advantage because they could be 
uh, trading locally in Japan and then using the networks, the, the, the imperial networks to uh, bring all these goods around the empire essentially. So while uh, East Asian merchants might have find more like bureaucratically difficult to travel uh, all the way from, from Tokyo to, to, um, to London, of course. Uh, the textbook is actually an interesting thing. What I've been looking at is, I've been looking at like, yes, uh, like um, sources written at the time. And for instance, I, I mentioned the National Congress, uh, uh, the, the National Conference on Education, I think I mentioned before. And in their first, uh, I think it's like an opening pamphlet or something, or like one of their first documents issued, they have a... Um, um like a bibliography of like suggested books for like for national education for national education in terms of like specifically for the, the nationalist kind of education that they were uh planning and what i found is that japan is mentioned a lot like there is a lot of english english books about japan going around but also in, in terms of uh, for instance, in uh, journals, like in journals that, that were advertising about Japanese or like English books about Japan, they were like, uh, like uh, advertised all over the place. And I think this is actually, of course, like my, I think the, that conference is the, conf, the, the, the document that, that, that I saw from the National Education Conference is uh, 1900s or 1906 around that kind of time. So maybe it's a bit later than what you've been like uh, looking at in the textbooks. But I think it's, it's that kind of interesting, like what kind of informations, of course, were, were, were circulating about Japan at the time. So I, I, very interesting stuff, to be honest. And I hope to actually work on that more, but I'm not sure yet, but <laughs> I think I hope to finish this, this chapter first uh, as soon as possible. Uh, the third question about matchboxes, like small industries, as I mentioned before, I think is a scholar that you mentioned Oishi? Maybe it's uh, Oishi Sensei, yeah. yeah. So I think, so I've been reading his, his works, of course, like uh, it's, it's probably the major inspiration behind what I mentioned before being my chapter on the Indian community is like his works are, are, are the main source that I've been reading and, until now. So of course, I'm, I don't know how, I don't know when, but I, I really want to use it. And especially on the, uh, the issues of, of, of matches, it seems to be like one of the biggest uh, connection there because I've been reading recently while I was preparing like in uh, a local, like news, news like of today though about like history of like Indo-Japanese, especially like uh, Bombay, I think, and uh, they mentioned the fact that Japan was actually like early on was actually very active in Bombay. I think it was Bombay, yeah, in in the area, and I think that historically, thanks to the commercial networks, Bombay is, is kind of like one of the biggest center of Japanese activities, and I think he. I hope I'm not mixing up cities, but it is in Bombay where there is uh, like the the highest number of like um, Japanese brothels as well, like brothels, and, and also there is also a Japanese cemetery there. So it's kind of like that's what I hope, like to bring back the analysis of the like merchant communities in Japan back to um, South Asia as well, like to bridge that connection again. Of course, again. If everything goes right, this should be like a third or, or, or fourth chapter. So I'm really lo looking forward to the moment when I'm going to actually write this because it means that I've written everything else. <laughs> so I hope that, uh, that that time will come soon. And then the last uh, travelogues and the uh, like the other the connections. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. There is so much more stuff in terms of the connections and you know buddhism is kind of like and I, I, of course it's not the lazy answer but it's always the easiest answer like it is the least is the easiest like thing to look at of course like we're talking about uh, a myriads of books and documents written in extremely uh, 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 um, complicated japanese so of course it's, it's not easy 
by the term is there is a lot more that, that needs to be understood. And I think that there is actually a lot of scholars, as far as I've seen in India, who have been like trying to look for like this kind of other connections. And in terms specifically of economics, it's one of those like small little like um, sub projects of this kind of broader Indo-Japanese entanglement. The fact that especially in the period like the interwar period, I think that India becomes uh, a, a somehow important element in the analysis of like Japanese, um, especially Marxists who use India like a sort of like uh, uh, like, you know, be aware of what India is like, how India underdeveloped. So like this kind of arguments about how the economic example of India for Japan. And, I, and I'm not, I mean, I've read about it in like an old book, um, which I'm not sure what it is right now, <laughs> but it is an old book about uh, Indo and Japanese uh, 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 connections. And I think there is a very, like a lot of interesting stuff. I mean, there is, it's not just economics. Uh, by reading uh, Puran Singh's uh, biography, autobiography, there is a bit about the Great India Circus traveling to, to Japan. So, so there is even there, like even more stuff to look at, even more interesting. I mean, like for me, you know, I, I much rather look at why was the Great India Circus, which is one of the first circuses to be established in India? Why was the, was it in Japan in 1902? I think in 1902. Like you know, trying to understand also that kind of connections. Also, because I think it, it relates a lot to kind of like um, or, Orientalist imageries of India in Japan, like circulating at the time. And I'm thinking about. Uh, I think he's Akutagawa's um, Majutsu. He's a book about, yeah, like Majutsu, yeah. So and it's, I also uh, wrote that really, yeah, I mean, strange essay on Parsi. So Akutaga, Morioka, yeah. and his figures certainly did pay attention to India in orientalist ways to some extent. So, yeah, I agree. There is so much stuff. It's just yeah, that. I agree. <laughs> until now, we focused on, 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 like, as far as I see, until now, we focused on. Buddhism and the and, and the revolutionary encounters mm -hmm. so far, like me, Christianity as well. So, um, yeah, yeah, Christian, yeah actually, Japan, Christians in India also, actually, have, just, yeah, cross relationship. Now that you mentioned about the, about the, um, the Christianity, I just I was again during these like random searches, I found the documents or like the reports of the a Japanese YMCA group uh, going to India in, uh, I'm not, I think 1907 again, like that kind of period or like more or less. And I'm not sure, I think the, the name, if I, can, if I can one second stop sharing, I'll find the name because it's, uh, he was a, a famous Japanese reverend, but I'm not sure uh, exactly the name, but I'll send it to you as soon as I found it. As soon as I find it again, but yeah, so yeah. I've been reading about it. Yeah, there was some Sorry, really yeah. famous uh, Christian in Punjab who became famous in Japan, and somebody translated his biography into Japanese also. So, do, have you ever come across this figure? He was originally, I mean, he wasn't a Christian, but he was converted in Christianity, and then he became kind of saint in Punjab, and then somehow. Some Japanese intellectual got really, I mean, became attracted to his and his uh, ideas and life. So I mean, his biography was translated into Japanese in the early 20th century again. Uh, no, I'm not aware of this person. But okay, I will find out. Uh, I will send you yeah, the name. Please, please. Also, I send it in the chat, the, the, the Wikipedia page of the Japanese uh, the Christian who went to, to India with the YMCA. Thank you so much. Is in yeah. the here. Joseph Sakunoshi Motoda. Sorry, what's the name again? He's here in the chat. Um, I don't want to butcher oh, it. I, I haven't got the chat, actually. I think you sent the chat to oh, somebody. No, no, sorry. I think, yeah, I think I sent it to, sorry. Yeah, you just, you just <laughs> send it to me, not to, not to the group. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. I got it. Okay, yeah. so he's, he's the kind of person that I've been, I, I just found, I think if you follow, there is the Wikipedia, in Wikipedia, 
there is the third um, the, 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 the third reference is the PDF about like his experience in Japan in, in India sorry his experience in India yeah okay thank you so and much if, yeah. and then I'll send you and then if you want I'll send you there is this um, I found one of these like articles in in, um, in Japanese so I can send it to you in Japanese if you want okay thank you very much yeah thank you wow interesting Sorry, I did take too much yes, time. Yes, uh, and again, yeah. Yeah, let's, let's collaborate in the future. Yes. <laughs> let's collaborate in the future. Please do yes. come to Japan as soon as possible. I hope, I hope soon, I hope soon, to be honest. Thank you so much. Thank you. Maybe I'll come in with a question here, Francesca, if you don't mind. So, uh, you know, I totally understand the, kind of your concern about the, the project kind of expands forever and ever. And it's the, one of the difficulties is how to kind of rein it in. So perhaps to kind of follow up on the, the earlier question about you know, how to fit this in as the greater structure of the dissertation. Um, maybe uh, if I might ask you, uh, are there any kind of afterlives of the, the movement or the trends that you're looking at in this first chapter? Um, and how you see that connecting with other concerns or, or these themes that you're going to be looking at for your other uh, chapters um, for this particular project in this particular time. Um, this is perhaps much later than your 1920s cutoff date, uh, but when you talked, uh, especially near the end, when you, you wondered about you know, kind of Japanese uh, coverage of South, East, South Asian students, one of the things that came to mind was, um, you know, the, the World War II program of sponsoring a students not just from India but also from Southeast Asia and certainly of course East Asia to come to Japan um, and I mean they're all kind of uniformly young men as opposed to any uh, usually from a wealthy background um, so uh, and I'm not sure how if that ties into the Swadeshi movement or the kind of concerns that you're looking at but it's certainly something that has um, kind of present day traces in something like JASO, right? Uh, these students uh, have, coming in under the auspices of the Japanese government, um, which continues nowadays in this present form of uh, you know, sponsoring international students, but hopefully for wildly different purposes. So, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, perhaps this is a rather roundabout way of getting to the question, but yeah, do you see kind of um, legacies or kind of later iterations of this of uh, the things that you look at in chapter one uh, and perhaps that might be mm. one way to organize the things that you want to or think you might look at in the later chapters of the dissertation okay thank you um what are the things that i see running through like all the chapters kind of so well your 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 questions um I think that one thing that I'm trying to look for in all the chapters is the kind of how their interactions, how their interactions were kind of like enabling each other to make arguments about modernity, like how the fact that these people were interacting or Indians or like South Asians, because of course always specify that I'm saying Indians, but it's much broader kind of uh, environment there. I think is about how their their entanglement enabled them to make uh, a question or like arguments about Asian modernities or uh, arguments about a sort of like non-Western forms of modernity. And I know uh, again, I think it's uh, it's one of the issues that I'm trying to go with, like overcome is the fact of like creating a coherent kind of structure for all of these different uh, uh, pieces that I'm trying to like analyze and to be honest I think that's the hardest part for me the way I see it that's the hardest part of all PhDs like trying to get everything under one clear uh, like methodology or like one clear set of arguments and if I'm not sure that answer your question I'm I am blabbering my way out of, it, of the question but I think that the the second point that you, that you raise about the students um, I, I, if I gotta be honest, I need to look into it. Like I'm, I have tried to. I'm reading stuff like, especially like anthropological works about uh, 
uh, Indian migrants in Japan, like recently, like written. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to read those kind of stuff as well. But again, I'm also trying to not end up into like a deeper, like rabbit hole that I'm, I'm currently in. And uh, if I find anything, I think it's going to be worth like uh, connecting all of these dots, like from the pre-war and post-war sections. But again, I, I got to be honest, I'm not sure how to, <laughs> how to answer the problem about that. I mean, that's, I think, as was mentioned earlier, right, this is, very, and as you've mentioned a lot already, it, this is a very much project in process. So mm. uh, I, I think it's more the excitement of where and which direction it could go. Um, if I might also just tack on one other question specific to this chapter, right, uh, I think you mentioned at the very end, um, you know, the, the group of South Asian students uh, in Japan, right, are not in any way some sort of monolith. They all had kind of different... Mm -hmm perspectives and purposes being there. And I think one of the interesting things that you mentioned was that some of them were quite aware of Korea as well, right? So, and uh, I found it an interesting kind of contrast to your earlier discussion uh, of the attract one of the attractions of Japan being not the kind of imperial England, not the imperial Western center, but uh, Japan's already uh, an imperial nation at this point, particularly with Korea and Taiwan. So I wonder if that's actually factored into any of the conversations or the, you know, uh, discussions about Japan from uh, the, the student side or perhaps the broader discussions in India at the time, um, you know, especially since there's this uh, discussion of uh, an Asian solidarity, but perhaps an Asian that sees Korea or Taiwan as somewhere else. Uh, like, how does that kind of geopolitics map out in the discussions at the turn of the century. Yeah. So, uh, so the people, again, I, I mentioned it before, there are, there are two people who have been working more closely on uh, this kind of Indo-Korean connection are Satoshi Mizutani and Aaron Peters. They, as far as I know, they've been the ones that I know that um, I've, I've been working more. And as far as I've read from uh, their research, it's kind of, there is actually a lot of interesting stuff going on and there is a lot of Indians openly criticizing, despite being in, in Japan, openly criticizing the, the Japanese for their actions in Korea. And, um, and I think there is also, it's also worth mentioning that even like the staunchest like Japanese supporters early on, like at Tagore, even like, I think up to 19, the, the end of the first decade of the 20th century. Tagore was also one of those like big supporters of Japan. But then in his famous three lectures, I think he, he, he makes three different lectures in Japan in three different times. I think uh, 1907, maybe 1912, 15, and then in the 20s, he openly criticized Japan as I think most people know because he's, he's one of the biggest figures. And also, I think what is nice is the fact that, as I mentioned already, there is this kind of a like a lot of collabor like inter-Asian collaboration going on at the same time. In, uh, in I think in, in one of the power, one of the slides, I there is a quote from Puran Singh, in which he mentions how like Filipinos and uh, in and the Koreans and Chinese were all meeting together. And I think that this is this where the, like this kind of interaction, like this kind of places, these spaces of interactions, which not many people ha have been able to access. I mean, there is a Re Rebecca Carl article about uh, this association created by the Chinese and Indian students. That's the main reference that I've been like having until now. I'm not sure if there is anything more on the same topic. I think I saw, I've seen just another article about it. And uh, and yeah, like these kind of spaces are those where, like the the kind of criticism of Japan was more uh, like was actually stronger, even like among like Indian circles. Mm -hmm. And in fact, this I think is reflected by the fact of the ambivalence of the many Japanese um, political figures about this kind of, of encounters. Where on one hand, for instance, Okuma Shigenobu. He's, he's considered now in the literature, he's considered one of the most pan-Asianists uh, like politician already back in 1907. But as far as I've traced 
the, the story, he gives three different speeches, in two in 1907 and one in 1915. And he, change, he changes his opinion almost every time. So in one, one speech in 1907, he's invited these Indian students in, uh, in Japan organize uh, a, a Shivaji celebration, which he was like celebration or initiated by Tilak first in, uh, in 1894, 95, I'm not sure exactly when. So he's invited to this Shivaji celebration. And, uh, and Okuma says essentially that, you know, India, India is well treated by the British. So don't bother, <laughs> don't bother being like a uh, seditionist. But then in like in another speech from the same year, he says that three, 300 million Indians are waiting for the Japanese to save them. But of course the audience, like, the audience has changed and now he's making that speech in front of like businessmen, in front of like um, Japanese businessmen. So I, I think this kind of like uh, connections between like Indians and Koreans happens a lot of time in, in spaces that now we might not even be aware of anymore, just simply because there are not many sources about it, or the other very scattered, or the languages used might vary from Marathi to Chinese to, to Japanese to Filipino, and we don't even know unless we find them in all these different archives. Thank you very much. Can I ask about language learning? I mean, does Francine, does she tell us when he arrived in Tokyo, whether he had, you know, any competence in Japanese? Um, and what was the lingua franca of these South Asian students when they're in Tokyo? Well, he arrives in English knowing, uh, yeah, sorry, he, he arrives in Japan knowing, uh, I think three languages already. And when he arrives in Japan, as required at the time, all students had to learn Japanese and German, <laughs> because of course the irony is that German was the language of, of science. <laughs> so, so he 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 arrives, and it seems like he doesn't specify it, but it seems like he had some grasp of Japanese. The point is that oftentimes English again became also at that time already. A kind of like a lingua franca in the sense that all these people, uh, all the students who went from South Asia most likely had English education, almost everyone also, also which is confirmed by the letters of, of, of um, recommendations that I mentioned in those certificates of identity. Like these letters, like they're all from um, English institutions, like institutions where English was the main language. None of them is written in any local language or, uh, or stuff like that. So we already have most likely like, a, I don't wanna say a, a first generation, but maybe a second or even like third generation of, of Indian students who were using openly English in their um, communications. And a lot of time, some Japanese people also were able to communicate in English, uh, like for, I mean, uh, Okakura is like, for instance, the most famous one. He spoke in English when he went in, in Bengal, like he didn't have any issues. I mean, he worked in the US as well. So I'm sure that uh, also other people like Takakuzu Junjiro or Anisaki Masaharu, who are these big like scholars of, of, of Buddhism, they must have known English as well. Like these were like, uh, even the Japanese author, even the Japanese, at professors in in, uh, in uh, um, Calcutta, they, they they wrote and spoke and uh, and taught in English. So we already see like the emergence of kind of English as a lingua franca in these kind of situations. Now, whether or not Puran learned Japanese, I think is not specified. Although he has written so much about Japan, I think Puran Singh is the is for me as far as far as I've seen, he's the proper. Is properly the closest figure to Okakura Tenshin in terms of, I mean, he he, he writes a book about the the, the 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 poetry of the East, like the Orient, and he includes and he needs a categorization. India is part of like like the, 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 the same cultural sphere as like the um, Japanese poetry, so we're talking about maybe the closest to a, a, a South Asian counterpart to Okakura. So this kind of like uh, 
orientalist uh, people like and like this kind of like very aesthetic based or, or like um culture of, of the orient mm. thank you thank you something to say i'll stick this comment Mm. Okay, anyone else? Like a, a curiosity or something? <laughs> Well, maybe if we don't have any further questions, we can uh, close it here. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. One second.